About 71% of the surface area of our home planet, Earth, is covered with water. The seas of our world are home to hundreds of thousands of marine plants and animals. The seas with Nemo and friends is 185,000 square feet and is the sixth largest aquarium in the world, which is pretty cool. And I, okay, think that it's actually pretty cool. I think it may get a little too much hate, okay? Stop hating on the seas, okay? The seas are great. The seas are our friends. Sometimes they're alive. In this very wet episode of Offhand Disney, we will be going over the abandoned, canceled, and sometimes forgotten history of the living seas, known today as the seas with Nemo and friends. From elevators that somehow managed to operate underwater, to a musical score that you just can't find anywhere else these days, to the canceled concept of a Greek god whose sole purpose was to lead us to a underwater sea base. It'll make sense, okay, very soon, I promise. Join me as we dive below the waves, turn back the clock, and begin our voyage to Sea Base Alpha in this, The History of the Living Seas. How would you like to venture into the living seas, yet stay safe and dry? In Sea Base Alpha, you'll do just that, and still be able to explore the wonders of our aquatic frontier. A futuristic research station beneath the waters of the largest saltwater tank environment in the world. After the death of Walt Disney in 1966, pushing on toward the 70s, Imagineering and the Walt Disney Company as a whole began plans for what would eventually become the second park at the Walt Disney World Resort, Epcot Center. Some Imagineers were leaning on the concept of a permanent World's Fair, where guests could journey through different pavilions representing different countries of the world and sample their cuisine, experience their arts, admire their architecture, and of course, most importantly, drink their alcohol. Now, if you're a regular Haunted Mansion aficionado like yours truly, what I'm about to say next is going to sound extremely familiar. Another half of Imagineering wanted to take the Tomorrowland concept to the next level. A park that displayed emerging technologies taught you about our planet and stood as sort of a view into a hypothetical future that could be possible with the help of technology. And I'm sure we're all familiar with what ended up happening. The front of the park would be deemed Future World, and the back, of course, would become the World Showcase. The new park would become a sort of mishmash of those two ideas. As Epcot Center entered creative development, an idea for a sea-based pavilion for the front half of the park, Future World, was conceived. You can see a very early version of it right here in this model, right there. It's where the land pavilion is located today, is actually where the sea pavilion was going to be located in about 1978, as they were planning this park. The entrance was to be flanked by two very large reflection pools, obviously to give the impression that you were entering the ocean, and the entrance itself to the pavilion was sculpted almost to look like you were walking into an ocean cave. And even in this very early concept, you can see that the plans for the pavilion included a massive aquarium. And don't worry, we'll get to the aquarium in a second. I think one little sort of interesting tidbit that isn't important to the wider history of the Living Seas is noticing how finished the land and the sea pavilion look in this small model. That being said, the land pavilion also got those big round pools in front of it. I don't know what it was with Disney and these giant, you know, pools of water, but in front of the land and the sea pavilion, I guess they're like sister pavilions, right? So I guess it, it kind of makes sense if you think about it, except, you know, the land is about the land and the seas are about the seas. But who am I to judge? Who I'm not an Imagineer here, okay? I'm not on the creative development team. Looking around at the other future world pavilions, they're just sort of nondescript white shapes where the land pavilion has the big prism greenhouse and the seas obviously has the entrance facility completely done. So it seems that they had nailed down that they absolutely did want a land and sea pavilion from the early conceptual days of Epcot Center. Which is odd because moving forward to the actual opening day of the park in October of 1982, the land pavilion did end up opening along with many, but also importantly, not all of the future world pavilions that were there on opening day. However, the living seas did not make the opening day deadline after all. Instead, when the park opened where today you would find the Seas Pavilion, it was just an empty plot of land. There was nothing next to, well, the, the land. This is because Disney wasn't comfortable with the amount of knowledge they had on marine biology and ocean life, so they needed more time to nail down the scientific and edutainment specifics behind the pavilion. And of course, one of those classic Epcot problems that we will keep running into over the course of this series time and time again, the trouble with finding a sponsor. 
Given Disney's original goal for the park of showcasing advancing technologies, all of the Future World pavilions on opening day were hosted by sponsors. The sponsorship of these pavilions in Future World allowed companies to showcase not only their technology, but also to advertise to guests as they made their way through attractions and displays and shows. These companies would also foot some of the bill for construction and maintenance of these pavilions, so that way Disney wasn't spending as much as they normally would to construct this brand new pavilion. It wasn't until United Technologies, nowadays known as the Raytheon Company, signed on to sponsor this pavilion that development and construction really started to begin. However, before United Technologies signed on to sponsor the project, the original dream for the Seas Pavilion was much, much bigger. The pavilion would not just serve as a place where people could go and ride an attraction and see some fish, but would also be a real, functioning, marine research facility, and was going to feature a much, much larger dark ride than what ended up opening alongside the pavilion in 1986. The original idea consisted of an Omnimover ride vehicle being a bit more enclosed than it normally is to sort of resemble a bubble, and the Greek sea god Poseidon calming a storm before inviting us down under the waves to explore the many different marine biomes of our planet, before he led us to a futuristic sea base where we'd be able to explore more of the ocean on our own two feet, we wouldn't have to be in an Omnimover anymore. This original concept was developed creatively so much that there's actually a poster we can look at that features Poseidon and the storm he was meant to calm during the dark ride. However, when United Technologies signed on to sponsor the pavilion, all of the ideas had to sort of be reined in a little bit. Uh, a lot a bit. The seas would no longer function as a real research facility, and the dark ride would be shortened by a lot. How much do I mean by a lot? Well, the dark ride that is actually the same name as the pavilion that we have there today is longer than what we originally had in 1986. The Nemo ride duration is only about four minutes, and the Caribbean Coral Reef, the ride we had in 86, was even shorter than that. So, you know, not very long. However, the most important aspect of the seas, you know, the aquarium, the fish, the marine life, would be spared no expense and would be given the largest saltwater tank in the world, you know, at the time of its completion and opening. And even though it no longer holds that record, it is still extremely impressive to behold. That tank holds 5.7 million gallons of water. This right here is one gallon of water. So just imagine 5,699,999 more of these, and you have a rough idea of how much water is in the aquarium at the Living Seas. It's a, it's a good amount of water. I'm gonna have to drink this whole thing before the end of the video. I guess there's no better time to start than the present. We'll watch the rest of the video. We'll check in later. So yeah, all in all, you know, in short, it's a good amount of water. And although it wouldn't be a functioning research facility and Poseidon would no longer lead us to the sea base, the sea base was still very much part of the story of the pavilion. It would be our base of operations from which we could access different modules where we could learn about the ocean. And at long last, with a sponsor lined up and a concept ironed out, construction would begin on the living seas. No longer would the facade look like the entrance to an ocean cave surrounded by pools of water. Now, the pavilion was housed inside of a building that was meant to sort of mimic to represent the swell of ocean waves. The marquee of the pavilion was perched atop of ocean rocks that would sometimes be hit by a big wave, a big splash of water. I'm sure we're all familiar with that effect, it can still be seen today in front of the seas, except, you know, you got the, the added presence of the seagulls, which I think are fun. But at long last, after four years of waiting, the Living Seas was finally open and operating next door to its sister pavilion, The Land, in 1986. Now, if you remember, I mentioned earlier that the aspect of the sea base was carried over to the final design of the pavilion. The sea base, of course, being located, <coughs> you know, underwater. So how is it from a storytelling perspective that guests would be present on land at Epcot Center one second to being miles under the ocean's surface the next? Well, my friend, I am glad you asked. Honestly though, no, I'm, I'm actually thrilled you asked me that. United Technologies, the sponsor of the pavilion on the day it opened, developed and manufactured products in aerospace systems, aircraft engines, HVAC, fire and security, building automation, industrial products, and elevators and escalators. You know, those, those things that you hop on while you're trying to get back to your room at your hotel, or if you're trying to get to you know, Aeropostale at the mall? Elevators and escalators, baby. So, <clears throat> you've heard of a space elevator, right? An elevator you can take to space, you know, the moon, a space station hanging out there. You see it in Space 220, they're really, really cool. How about instead of taking an elevator to space, you would take an elevator down, down into the depths of the ocean. Not an elevator, but instead, a hydrolator. When guests first entered the pavilion, they would view a short movie called The Sea, very creative name there, 
Disney good work, to learn how our planet's oceans were formed before boarding these hydrolators. Now, unfortunately, this is a history video. I do have to break the magic, but these hydrolators weren't actually taking you down to the sea floor. They weren't actually taking you under the water. I'm sorry, no, it was an illusion. The effect of moving down into the depths of the sea was achieved with moving walls, similar to the Indiana Jones adventure, sound effects, and a vibrating floor that gave guests the illusion that they were descending. And honestly, looking at videos of it, it seems pretty convincing. It does look like you're moving down sort of in the the same way that the submarines at Disneyland sort of give the illusion that you're descending through the water, it's very convincing. After exiting their hydrolators, guests would then board an Omnimover, referred to in this instance though as a sea cab, not a dune buggy, not a clam mobile, a sea cab. They would then enjoy the Caribbean coral reef attraction that took them right through the middle of the world's largest saltwater tank at the time of opening, before exiting out much like we do today into the rest of Seabase Alpha, which is still actually curiously renamed Seabase Alpha. We'll talk about that when the retheme happens down the line, but it's, it's very interesting to me they just kept that around. Well, it's a good name. Why would you get rid of it? This is going to take a while. The Coral Reef ride was essentially just the portions of the Finding Nemo ride that we have today where you go through the tank. That's all that the Coral Reef ride was. You don't have any of the scenes from the beginning half of the attraction. You would then be able to, at your own leisure, explore different modules, like Module 1A, which taught guests about ocean ecosystems. Or perhaps I could interest you in Module 1D, Undersea Exploration, a show that was hosted by an animatronic version of the Jason Submersible. Very interesting. He's actually... It's actually kind of cute. Why do I all of a sudden want a plushie of this deep sea submersible? Disney, there's merchandising opportunities you're just throwing away here. Does that not strike your fancy? Fine, what about module one and two B, the Marine Mammal Research Center, which was home to the pavilion's manatees that I believe are still there today. I love the manatee show. You make sure to show up when they feed them. It's a wonderful experience. I say show, it's not really a show, they just sort of come out and eat their lettuce and then swim around. It's a great time. Maybe watching all of those majestic fishies swim around in their giant tank got you a little peckish, you know? Maybe you want to eat some fish in front of some living fish. You monster. <laughs> Enjoy your meal at the Coral Reef Restaurant, which offers seafood and a beautiful view into the pavilion's giant aquarium. You monster! It is one of the most visited places on Earth. Millions of people have done this. And millions of people have visited Epcot. But very few of them have done this. You were diving in a place that is a legend among divers around the world. This is the famed Living Seas at Epcot. And you were part of the adventure called Dive Quest. Here, you don't just see Disney, you do Disney. I don't know about that one. And you do it in a place that has almost six million gallons of salt water. Okay, phrasing. What's here? Oh, the coral. The huge turtle. Sharks and turtles. And Sharks, turtles. Beautiful groupers, eagle rays. Spotted eagle rays, there's three sharks. Green sea turtles, it's really awesome. The living seas and the dive quest experience is truly like nowhere else on Earth. Some divers refer to this as the sixth largest ocean. Disney, name one diver who refers to this as the sixth largest ocean. Okay, listen, I'm giving them some flack here, but Dive Quest was actually extremely unique for its time, and still, I would argue, is. You could still do it, by the way. Dive Quest is still available. You do have to be scuba certified, which I am not, but it is one of my dreams, actually, one day to be able to do Dive Quest. It seems so fun and so unique. It's like the behind the scenes tour, except, you know, instead of going behind the scenes of one of the best Disney attractions ever created, you go and swim with sharks that Disney assures don't want to eat you. But you know, look, look at that guy's face. You never truly know with a shark. I mean, I don't know why I have to be scuba certified. I'm literally, I'm underwater right now drinking water and speaking to you very, very clearly. But you know, it's their rules. You have to follow them. And I don't think it's gonna happen. The Living Seas would remain mostly the same until 2003 when a little-known Pixar movie, it's a little indie film, called Finding Nemo released in theaters. 
Elements of the building's theming began to change after that movie was released, and in 2004, Turtle Talk with Crush opened in the former Earth Systems, or 1C, module. And when I tell you Turtle Talk with Crush was a success, that's sort of underselling it, because this is now my era, when I was a kid visiting Walt Disney World. You know, the mid-ish 2000s, you know, seven-year-old Dallin was running around Future World. He wanted to go see Turtle Talk with Crush. He wanted to interact with this Disney character he had seen on the screen. So did everybody, it seemed. And this was, in my opinion, Disney's first sort of dipping their toe into featuring popular Disney Pixar characters in attractions and pavilions, not just as meet and greet characters. And you know, by dipping their toe, I mean in 2005, the Living Seas closed forever to make way for the Seas with Nemo and Friends. The entire pavilion was rethemed. Because back in 1998, United Technologies dropped their sponsorship of the Living Seas leaving all operating and maintenance costs up to Disney. And let me tell you, taking care of all that, all those fish, all those sharks, those manatees, it can't be cheap. I don't have a ballpark estimate, but you know, there's no way it's cheap. And that I think is one of the shortcomings of opening day Epcot Center. Even though the sponsorship program is good for Disney, it's good for the companies, and it's good for us, we get more attractions, it really isn't that sustainable. Because if you look up the history of a lot of original Epcot attractions, their stories are very similar. The sponsor dropped out, and then Disney couldn't do the upkeep, and then the attraction closed down. It's really sad, and I, I think the longest running sponsor at Epcot, I believe, is Chevrolet over at Test Track. It was General Motors when it was World of Motion, but they're the same company, it's just a different name. Okay. And unfortunately, because United Technologies dropped their sponsorship, Disney didn't need to advertise their ocean elevators anymore, and the hydrolators were removed when it reopened as the seas. Now, instead of taking a very convincing hydrolator ride down to your sea cab, you would just walk into the queue, like a regular attraction, to board your clam mobiles. The, the sea cabs were rethemed as clams. Now, I think the loss of the hydrolators was huge. It was a horrible, horrible loss. I can appreciate how it made extending the dark ride possible. The former entrance hydrolators and the viewing area for the short The Sea film were demolished to make way for new queue space for Finding Nemo. A ride that contains one of the most unnerving show scenes in any Disney attraction I've ever experienced. With the, with the anglerfish in the dark, it moves so fast and you can't see the back of the show scene. It just, it just unnerves me to my very core. I couldn't tell you why. If that anglerfish scene doesn't give you the heebie-jeebies just a little bit, you're either extremely brave or lying. Now, something to keep in mind as I tell you all of this, when I say the Living Seas was rethemed into the Seas with Nemo and Friends, the retheme actually didn't change too much about Sea Base Alpha itself. The hydrolators were gone. The dark ride was longer, but now Finding Nemo themed. There was now a Bruce the Shark play area and Turtle Talk with Crush, but it's very important to remember that Sea Base Alpha is still very much part of the story of the Seas. Unfortunately, you don't descend the hydrolators down to Sea Base Alpha, you just walk through the doors into Sea Base Alpha, which sort of diminishes the illusion a little bit. I really appreciate how when you step into Sea Base Alpha, there are no windows, there's no outside light, so it really does feel like you could be underwater. The sea base itself didn't change that much aesthetically either. Like, yeah, you have some Finding Nemo theming on the wall, but that's it. You walk into the seas with Nemo and friends nowadays, it's one of those few places at Epcot along with like the land and Spaceship Earth and Journey into Imagination where you can still feel that original Epcot presence, that vibe that really did sort of permeate the entire park for the better part of like 25-ish years. We lost Horizons, we got rid of Ellen's Energy Adventure, we're getting a new test track. The land, I think the land is timeless and perfect. Spaceship Earth may or may not be getting an update, I don't, who knows at this point. But the seas, while being the first sort of IP tie-in to a pavilion at Epcot, somehow, I don't know, in a weird way, still feels very Epcot to me when I walk into it. Old Epcot isn't really something you can describe, it's not something that I can make a video essay about, I actually, I... I could do that. It's more of a feeling that you get when you walk into these pavilions or these attractions. The Living Seas, or I should say, The Seas, has it, okay? Still, even though it's IP, still has it. Now the remnants of the Living Seas are pretty hard to come by because the old hydrolators were turned into the gift shop and the queue for Finding Nemo. And as I mentioned, a lot of the interior theming stayed the same. They didn't change too much of it. 
I've shown this donor plaque a couple of times in this video actually, which still bears the name on it, The Living Seas, the original name for the pavilion when it opened in 86, so that, you know, is kind of a reference. And while not a remnant of the old Living Seas pavilion, it is sort of a reference. Upon exiting the gift shop at the end of the pavilion after you make your way through, be sure to make your way through, by the way, make sure to turn your attention downwards as you walk out of the pavilion, you might notice a couple darker shaded circles in the pavement. I think there are two of them. These are a reference to the original hydrolators you would use to get down to sea base alpha. They're roughly the same size and obviously the same shape. Very cool. It's not like they used to stand there or anything. That's not where they used to be. It's not a memorial pavement color. It is, however, just a fun wink and nod to the history of this pavilion, and one of the cooler aspects, might I say. I feel like I was able to experience the Hydrolators at least once because it closed in 2005, right? So, I mean, I was, what, seven-ish at the time? I probably got a few good Hydrolator rides in before it closed. Don't remember it, wish I did. And of course, if you want a nice throwback to the original pavilion, you could always stand in front of that marquee and listen as the waves hit the rocks and then the, the seagulls chirp, mine, mine, mine. But um, ignore the seagulls for a second because that water effect has been there for nearly 40 years. Now I'm gonna go out on a high note here, literally. We are going to finish by talking about the music of the Living Seas. I was going to do an entire video on the, the musical history of Epcot and Epcot Center, and then Kevin Perger, that hunk, had to go upload his masterpiece of a video, so I guess go check that out. But we're gonna talk specifically about the Living Seas. So much, I think, of what makes old Epcot, old Epcot, is the soundtrack, the old Innoventions loop, Listen to the Land, uh, the Horizons theme song, even though I do think that one's a little bit overly cheesy. It hasn't aged the best, it still is Epcot. And while that new Epcot music that they play in World Discovery and World Nature and World Celebration, it's all nice, you know, it's all sort of a new take on that classic sort of futurist motif. Now don't get me wrong, this isn't me minimizing the work that Pinar Top Rock did on the new Epcot loop, okay? The new Epcot loop is absolutely amazing and it was inspired by her very first ever trip to Epcot when she was 18 or 19 after only having been to Istanbul and Wisconsin in her life. So it's really, really neat to hear this music that was inspired by the original Interventions loop, sort of a modern take on it. It's wonderful. But that Interventions loop, man, the Interventions loop is, is just an entire, it's a different beast. Just the feeling that that old Innoventions loop elicits with the synths, it's just, it's something completely different, unique. The mastermind behind a lot of the Epcot music that we all know and love is a man named George Wilkins. George was hired by Walt Disney Imagineering in 1979 and served as sort of a protege to composer Buddy Baker, who you may know for writing the score for your favorite attractions like Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln or my favorite attraction, The Haunted Mansion. Now, George's very first assignment at Imagineering was to write an arrangement for Listen to the Land, now of course known as the best ride at all of Walt Disney World living with the land. And unfortunately, while driving home from work one day, probably after working on one of his mini masterpieces, Buddy Baker was involved in a car accident. Now don't worry, he was okay, but while he was recovering, he needed somebody to take up the reins for some of the new Epcot arrangements, and George Wilkins was the man for the job. George would later go on to write several different arrangements for Journey into Imagination and World of Motion. Now, of course, don't get it confused. He didn't write the songs themselves. The Sherman Brothers wrote One Little Spark, and Buddy Baker and Exitensio wrote Fun to Be Free for World of Motion. But you know how when you're on the Haunted Mansion, different variations of Grim Grinning Ghosts will play as you pass through different show scenes? Sometimes it'll be an organ or chimes or a piano for different scenes. How it sort of evolves as you move through the ride, those are different arrangements and somebody has to write that. That was George Wilkins' job for those two attractions. And while Horizons was under development, George finally got the chance to write all of the music for a singular attraction. All of the music you hear on Horizons, the area loop, all of it was written by him. But when it came time for the Living Seas, Disney needed a more intervention style sort of new age musical theme. So George was brought back onto the project along with another co-composer, Russell Brower. The composer of the classic, the iconic Innoventions loop that I know we all still sort of hum to ourselves today as we walk through the brand new version of Future World at Epcot. I just, it's so, so good. Who also, fun fact, wrote a lot of the music from many, many Blizzard games. We're talking World of Warcraft, Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King, Diablo 3, Hearthstone. When you hear the music in those games, just picture 
picture in your head. That same guy wrote the Interventions Loop for Epcot. What a legend. And I highly recommend if you want to learn more about Russell Brower and his work to go listen to the Tomorrow Society podcast from a couple years ago. They did a whole episode with him. There'll be a card right there in the top right corner. It's just so interesting to listen to this man talk about Epcot and the Sherman Brothers and oh, it's so good. Check it out, please. So you bring these two masterminds together, Russell and George for the Living Seas, and what else would you get besides an absolute banger? And I've been playing it in the background of this video this entire time. You can find the entire musical score for the pavilion on YouTube. And it really captures that sort of under the ocean, scientific, futuristic, sort of optimistic viewpoint that the Living Seas takes, while also tying in the feel of the music to the rest of Future World. It's just, it's so masterfully done. You know what? No, I'm going to say it. The Living Seas is a masterclass in how to do an Epcot Pavilion. The only thing wrong with it, I would argue, is the length and the theming of the original Dark Ride. A lot of what remains at the Seas with Nemo and Friends today is still reminiscent of that classic Epcot vision, and I would argue is a great sort of blueprint for Disney to follow if they want to convert more of these pavilions to IP-based pavilions with, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy Dark Rides or new Test Track Dark Rides. I don't know what that's going to be yet. But the Seas with Nemo and Friends somehow, for me, feels the least shoehorned, if that makes sense. Oh, I almost forgot the water gag. What would this video be without it? A lot cleaner. I know it may be tucked away in a dark corner of Epcot, but the next time you're in the neighborhood, the world nature neighborhood, be sure to stop by, visit the fishies, visit the manatees, visit Nemo and all of his friends, because this is one of the most unique pavilions, dare I say, one of the most unique attractions at all of Walt Disney World. <sighs> I did it, it's over, it's done. Now I can finally and truly be living with the seas. That's what this whole video is leading up to, to, th to this point where I made this living with the land reference. Just a, you know, it'd be a whole lot more great if they brought back even just one of the hydrolators, make it a, make thematic sense as to how we get down to the sea base. Just something to think about Disney. People mover, who needs it? Bring back the hydrolators. Welcome everybody to the end of this week's video. I sure hope you enjoyed it. I don't foresee this doing like huge numbers, but I really did want to do just another Epcot history video, just a Disney history video. I haven't done one in a while and the Living Seas and the Seas with Nemo and Friends is a little aspect of Epcot that I often, you know, skip over. I talk about very briefly here and there, but it's really, really underappreciated in my opinion. Did you enjoy this episode? Prove it, okay, just prove it. Hit the like button and if you're new around here and do you want more Disney history videos like this one, please be sure to hit the subscribe button. I will make more if this does well, don't worry. A massive thank you to my supporters over at Patreon. They got early access, I believe, to this video a couple days before YouTube got to, to see it. So if you're ever wondering why you go down to the comments hoping to get first comment and there's comments that are somehow like two days old, 48 hours old, that's why. They're Patreon supporters. They get to get, they get in early. If that sounds interesting to you, or if you want to maybe just, you know, help out the channel, head over there, even just $1 a month. That's right, just $1. One will get you access to most of the perks. Thank you again to all of my supporters over there. And if you want to follow me for free on other social medias, you can do that too. Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I am at Offhand Disney uh, on all of those platforms. I will be talking about the Living Seas over on one of those platforms. I'm not quite sure yet, but I, I just, I am, I'm on a Living Seas kick right now, okay? I'm sorry. That being said, everyone, thank you all so much for watching this video. I look forward to seeing you all in the next one. Maybe history, maybe just me ranting about the current state of Disney and the Disney parks, maybe. maybe we'll see. Thank you again, and goodbye.